Hello, everybody. I'm very excited about uh, getting to do this on what is probably two days before the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. This is Dr. Amber Strawn, who I talked to 10 years ago about the James Webb Space Telescope after I made a video and they were like, we liked it. We want you to come see our, we want you to come see our space telescope. Thank you so much for doing that 10 years ago. And it's been an eventful 10 years. A lot has happened both in astronomy uh, and in the world. How, how has that 10 years been for you? It's great to see you. Great to see you too. Wow. Yeah, I, can't believe, I can't believe it's been 10 years. I mean, in one sense, yeah. the time has flown in the other sense. Oh my gosh. Yeah. There's just, it's been a long wait. Like uh, us <laughs> astronomers, we're so ready to get yeah. this thing into space. So yeah, it's been a very busy 10 years. Um, and we're all just, we are ready. We're ready. Light that candle. <laughs> so my biggest question, and I know that this is, this question is going to be different for like every astronomer. Um, but what is the piece of data that you are, or the kind of data that you're most excited to see out of the web? It's hard to just narrow yeah. down uh, to one, because <laughs> I mean, the awesome thing about this telescope is that it's going to be able to do, you know, virtually everything like yeah. big telescopes like this can do so much science. Uh, my own area of research is galaxy evolution. So I am interested in how star formation and black hole growth um, happens in galaxies and how those processes change over time. And of course, we're missing like this key piece of the puzzle in galaxy yeah. evolution, yeah. which is the first galaxies, right? Yeah. Um, so we don't know how all that got started. So I think seeing those very early galaxies is going to be super interesting. The other end of the spectrum, right, completely far removed from my own research. But I think what this telescope is going to do in exoplanet science is going to be yeah. mind-blowing, groundbreaking, like all the big words. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, no, it's it's hard for me to not to, to, to think a, a lot about exoplanets just because like, I don't know, my like conception of the universe is very planet-based. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because because it's, it's what I have the most direct experience of. I go outside, I touch a planet, I eat a planet, I am a planet. Um, and that's a, that's a, the, the idea that there, you know, we know so much more about exoplanets than, than we did when I was starting to be interested in science. Like I remember the first time people were like, okay, we, we know for sure now that there are planets outside of our solar system. And before, cause we're about the same age. And before that, like we didn't, like we, like I, when I no. was in elementary school, we didn't know there were planets outside of the solar system. We just guessed exactly. there were. Yeah. And that's, it's, that's been such a huge revolution yeah. in astronomy. I mean, really in, in the last 20 years, but really in the last decade, I mean, it's only been in the last 10 years that we can sort of say definitively statistically that there are yeah. very likely more planets in the Milky Way than there are stars. And yeah. that's mind blowing, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and if we if we get lucky with uh, with JWST, or maybe even not lucky, we might be able to see even the first the first epic of stars, right? Right. So uh, pre galaxy well, stars. Yeah, or yeah, or the explosions of the first stars, and so the gotcha. first the very first stars that were born in the universe were all hydrogen and helium. Yeah. Like nothing else, right? Mm -hmm. The primordial soup that had. made the first yeah. stars. Yeah. And we think, and those were huge. And they explode, they were huge and they lived very fast and right. their explosions were, you know, these huge, massive uh, mm -hmm. explosions at the end of their lives. And we think, we hope we'll be able to see some hints of those, those first wow. stars exploding. The first supernovas in the yeah. universe. And that would have been not long after the Big Bang. Yeah, I mean, that's that's still around, yeah, that sort of 100 million years-ish, maybe a little mm -hmm. bit further back, yeah. And it's that's part of the fun part of this is that we don't really know, you know? Yeah. We, don't, yeah, yeah. we don't know <laughs> when any of this stuff happened because we've never seen it. Right. We have theories, and we have pretty good theories and simulations, you know, that, that tell us mm -hmm. what we think the early universe was like. Never seen it. That's the whole point. That's why we're building this thing, right? Amber, I have to ask you questions that are not about the web now that I have an astronomer near me. Is it, is it weird, which is, which is weirder that the universe has a beginning or the, or the uni or if the universe didn't have a beginning? Cause there's a part of me that's like, it would be way less weird if it didn't have a beginning. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like this is a gut feeling. It's not like anything yep. to do with like measurements or anything. It's just like it doesn't feel like it should. But like yeah. we know enough about the universe now that we have a pretty good idea of the timeline and how we 
uh, our solar system and our and Earth like fits into mm-hmm. it, and like it matters. Like the, you know, early on in the universe, the Earth couldn't have existed because the elements weren't there to for right, to, right. To, to exist. Um, but it feels very strange. Does it still feel strange to you? Like, are there still things in astronomy that feel very strange? That you're like, I can't believe that's actually how it is. Astronomy is filled with these things, right? <laughs> yeah. You can't think about astronomy for long without getting yeah. into existential crisis mode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, and so, yeah, that's one like weird. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, it is very odd. It seemed, it seems like it would be more, I don't know, somehow more natural if. Yeah. You know, it's just like, uh, this, is, this is the thing and this is how it is. And, yeah. and something sort of sustains it perpetually, but like, not only does it have a beginning, it doesn't, you know, end is a big question mark, but it right, certainly right. progresses past the point at which we are now. Like the universe 10 billion years from now is a different universe. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and of course there's also, you know, the theory of the multiverse. And so oh, that sure. kind of, wow. that kind of, you know, puts that, that idea of a beginning and, kind of makes it a little bit irrelevant you know mm-hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, right yeah which oh, again God. existential crisis mode but yeah. um yeah the i think other, another yeah. one is, oh i was going to give you my other one but yeah, maybe it's the it. same, it the same is, is it the same? the same my other one is the size um so like yeah. we have this idea of what's observable but i've gotten to the point where it would be very weird if the universe wasn't infinite like i like that's the yeah. use case that i think would be strange like what like nothing about what we see makes it feel like it isn't. Like, I don't know, that, that's a different perspective than I had 10 years ago when I was sort of like, I, the infinite universe doesn't make any sense. Now I'm like, well, I don't yeah. see why there isn't like an infinite, like if you point in a direction, why would there be an end to that direction? It's right. all, it's just fields and math. <laughs> I agree, I agree. Yeah, it seems like it should be. Um, yeah. The other, the, or the, and yeah, the, the size of the universe also goes into you this um, kind of almost a little bit of a sad idea that, you know, I think that there's probably evolved conscious life in the universe, just sure. given the size, right? The mm-hmm. sheer size yeah. and the, yeah. the numbers of stars and planets. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the other hand, the flip side of that is the universe is so big. It's actually probably pretty unlikely that we would ever, you know, make contact yeah. with the evolved conscious beings that are out there. It's like, that's yeah. so lonely. <laughs> it's a little lonely, but we have each other. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I feel like there are times when you don't want to talk too much about like the potential things we could figure out. But of course, one yeah. of the ones that that is very exciting is the potential of being able to do enough spectroscopy on the atmosphere of an exoplanet to say, well, that couldn't really happen without some kind of weird chemistry, like right. like the kind of chemistry that it, that we are, the, right. the living kind. I don't know. Do you feel like a, a little bit limited to to talk about the this, the implications of that are so big? Um, it, it it might feel a little bit weird to talk about it um, because, of course, there's no like we ha- we don't know the odds of that kind of discovery because like right, we don't know right. the odds of life in the universe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's we're though at least those of us the scientists that work on the the telescope are pretty yeah. we're pretty careful about not over promising. Yep. You know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so but, we, but, so so look, it's expensive, but we're gonna find <laughs> life. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so yeah. So we don't want to overpromise, but on the other hand, like you said, we don't know what we don't know. We could yeah. get really lucky. I mm-hmm. mean, I think when we discovered the Trappist system, people were pretty stunned. Right? Oh, That's yeah. A pretty amazing planet system that's like mm-hmm. in our cosmic backyard. One thing I like this is a question I've had that no one I couldn't find like an answer to. So the way that the web works, it has to keep the heat shield pointed toward the earth and sun to stay cold. But that seems like it means it can only kind of point in one direction. Now I'm sure that there's wiggle room there, but does that I, I feel like that means it can't see the whole sky. Can it not see the whole sky? So it can't see the whole sky at once, but oh, as well, it no, orbits- no, I neither can I. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but as it orbits around the sun, oh, you know, so like here's the sun, here's the telescope. Mm-hmm. It can sort of do this, right? It can see mm-hmm. all of that sky, but right. by the time it gets on the opposite side of the orbit, it can see all the rest. So over the course mm-hmm. of a year, it can see basically all of the sky. There's, a, there's probably a couple of little points in the sky that it can't see, but um, yeah. And that, and all that wiggling requires fuel and you can't refuel a spacecraft at L2. 
Um, right. So, so is that the limiting factor of the mission? Yep, fuel is a limiting factor. And we have a, a sort of baseline mission requirement of five and a half years. Oh, um, but we, but, give, but, give me more. <laughs> we, yeah, we, we're going to have more. I mean, yeah. um, we, sh we really should have more. Uh, we'll have enough fuel because once we, we, and this is all part of minimizing the mass of spacecraft, right? We yeah, make them yeah. as light as we can, and then we pack the rest of the, the mass limit with fuel. Um, and so we should have enough fuel to last at least 10 years. Um, and so we think we'll have a minimum of 10 years. And then the rest of it depends on how efficient of a launch we get. So if we get like right. a super launch mm. right on the right trajectory, wow. um, you know, our our estimates say that we could go, you know, 15 years, maybe longer, but that really depends on. That's wild. On so, the launch, so, yeah. so, so the orbital, the corrections to get to L2 that you might need, like you need a certain amount just to slow down once you get there, but just to get on the right trajectory, if you get it perfect, that could save you five years of fuel. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh man. Um, that makes me. Yeah. And, <laughs> well, and so everybody. And when do you know that? that? When do you know that moment when. Yeah. When, when you're like, ah, the lifetime of the mission just just increased or decreased. So we have, um, so yeah, everybody's like, whoo, once we launch and once the spacecraft separates, we can breathe. But no, no we can't. No, uh, no. <laughs> I'm not breathing have... for, for at least 30 days. Exactly. <laughs> um, but we have a really, really critical uh, burn at 12 and a half hours after launch. Okay. Um, so that's called MCC1A, mid-course correction 1A. Okay, uh, and so one. that... Um, that's the first really critical burn. The first one is often launch. the biggest one because you're like, yeah, we, we now know about where we're headed. Yeah. Yep. Um, and so that burn takes about a half an hour. Um, and it will be, you know, after that, we should have we should have a pretty good, I'm not sure how long it'll take, but you know, crunch the numbers yep. and then we'll figure out. Yeah, maybe three um, days. You know, how, yeah. yeah, how much fuel we have. Um, and then there's there's a couple more, you know, corrections out. Uh, on onto mm. to L2, but that that first one's the big one. And that's, so yeah, it's like, okay, launch, whew, you know, and then 12 and a half hours later is is another time, you know, astronomers are going to be paying really close attention. I mean, obviously you have to de design a lot of these things really specifically for a telescope. Are, are there like bits of this telescope that, that sort of impress you exceptionally? Um, is there like that, like, I don't know how you do spectroscopy on something as tiny as a planet that's light yeah. years away. I can't imagine that, that, uh, that, that technology was designed for anything, but this, I mean, there's so many, this telescope is so revolutionary and of course I'm a scientist. Um, but just being able to be at NASA over the last 12, 13 years and like, yeah watch the engineering happen has been mm -hmm. incredible. But to me, one of the most impressive like pieces of technology on this that's going to enable that spectroscopy is this, um, the micro shutter array we have on this telescope uh, that is going to allow us to do spectroscopy of multiple objects, you know, in a field. And so, oh. uh, so, so yeah. let me say what I think this means, even though I don't know about it. Um, and see if you see if I get it right. So what you're saying is so like a normal camera has a shutter, it opens and closes, you take a picture. This way you have like lots of shutters. I imagine they're you said micro, so they're very small, and you can open those yeah. shutters individually and be like, yeah. I only want to take a picture of this one spot or do spectroscopy on this one spot, like which is the edge of a star or a planet, so that you know you can like sort of tell what light is coming from there, which tells you the composition of that body. Yes. Uh, yeah, so that that's essentially it with with the exception that the the micro shutters are actually um, instead of taking pictures, it's going to get get a spectra of the oh, objects. Oh, so even more impressive, right? Because pictures are great. Yeah, but spectra are awesome because they tell you what's <laughs> in the picture. You're, you're like, right? you're like, see, look. With the web can totally take a picture of an exoplanet. It's going to look like a dot. And then you, I don't care about a dot. I care about what that dot's atmosphere is made of. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so all the, all the little micro shutters are, um, are individual um, slits that split the light up and allow you to get a spectrum. Mm. Oh my so God. when I go to observe at a ground-based observatory, and again, I study distant galaxies. So, you know, imagine the Hubble ultra deep field. And I say, okay, I want to get spectra of, you know, 20 galaxies, individual galaxies in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Uh, so when I go to a ground-based telescope, the way we do this at ground-based telescopes is you literally get a sheet of metal 
and then you cut slits in the sheet that mm. are going to line up and uh, where your galaxies are and that split the light into a spectrum. I mean, that's the slit physical. splits it up just by, like yeah. the depth of the metal or something. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Yeah. That's so wild. it's, um, yeah. So it's this concept of, you know, putting light through a little tiny slit that splits mm -hmm. it up into the spectrum. Okay. Um, so that's how we do it on, on the ground. Cause you can, you can walk over to your telescope and take your metal plate and put it in, put it in and get, you can't do that in space. Right. Yeah, and yeah, so, yeah, yeah. This, so you need something is, that's going to slit itself uh, a bunch of different times yes. in a bunch of different ways. Okay. Exactly. And this is the first time we've ever been able to do what's called multi-object spec spectra. I can't speak. It's a multi-object spectrograph. Yeah. <laughs> and it's yeah. the first one in space. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this little, this micro shutter array has all these teeny tiny little um, uh, slits or little windows that open and close and you can tell it which ones you want to open and close right. based on where your objects are. So it's, That's awesome. it's remarkable technology. That's so cool. yeah. yeah. And you don't need that. You don't need to develop something that complicated if you can just uh, change out your plates um, right. with by hand with the telescope that you can touch <laughs> exactly <laughs> that is that is mere inches away so the web needs to be in space um hubble's up there in space because mostly because of the atmosphere being a bit of a pain um which we've got we've got in, in since the launch of the hubble we've gotten much better at doing ground-based uh observations and, and like correcting for the atmosphere basically yes um sure. but the the web is going to benefit from that uh you know it's nice to not have to deal with the atmosphere but that's not the that's not the main reason why it's up in space right right well it's an infrared telescope yeah. right which is a pretty key difference uh from from hubble yeah and the thing about infrared astronomy is that it's incredibly hard to do from the ground because our atmosphere absorbs most of the infrared radiation mm, coming mm -hmm. in from space, which is great for us humans, right? We, yeah, yeah, we I love that. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> also, like our atmosphere creates infrared radiation, so like right. it just moves it around. It it is right. Yeah, it's that's a that's a soupy mess. Does anyone do right. ground based IR? Telescopy. It's it's possible, yeah, it's right. possible. But if you so if you okay. go and look at a spectrum in the infrared part uh, of 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 light, uh, yeah. there's parts that are just completely like useless. You know, okay. there are little bands in in an infrared part of a spectrum where you can uh, get you know useful information, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of it's completely washed out. Yeah. Uh, so in that sense, it's really important uh, to get into space where you don't have to deal with the atmosphere. Right. So there's not not dealing with the atmosphere, but then furthermore, you don't want any infrared radiation messing with this telescope because you want to do the exactly. faintest observations that you can. Right. And that's and that's essentially the reason why we put it in space. In, in, in particular, the the the, inf the mid infrared part of, of this telescope um, has to be extremely cold right. um, because everything glows in infrared light. Right. Uh, yeah. And including so like the mirrors would be glowing in infrared light. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so we have to get it very, very cold so that it, it doesn't sort of glow and see itself, detect itself. <laughs> and so, yeah. So that's that makes basically so much sense. We... Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's why we put it out into deep space for sure. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then you have that sun shield there to keep all of the sources yep. of, of infrared radiation, all of the sources of heat, not affecting the telescope, not affecting the detectors exactly. of the telescope. But then it's, exactly. and you have to have part of it be in the sunlight so that you can charge the batteries and so that you can run the, exactly. all of the, the stuff that can't operate well at near absolute zero. Right. And you know that, that the five layer sun shield, it creates yeah. a temperature difference of about 600 degrees from oh. the hot side to the cold side. So it's extreme. <laughs> yeah. One of the things I love about Hubble is the really, really sexy photos. Um, and so, so I also want really impressive photos from the James Webb Space Telescope. I assume that we're going to get some. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. They're going to be beautiful for sure. <laughs> uh, so don't worry. Don't okay. worry. Okay. They'll be gorgeous. <laughs> and, um, you know, when people, and this is, a, this is a common like worry concern because it's it, like, it is great. Important. You're just going to, you're going to measure a bunch of light. I can't see. And the astronomers are going to be really excited, but nothing for my calendar. <laughs> yeah, no, your calendar is going to be gorgeous. Okay, so great. 
So, and here's why. Well, when people ask me this, I always tell them. So, Hubble has a little bit of capability in the near infrared, right? It mm -hmm. has near infrared cameras, so just a little bit. Um, and I always tell people to go Google the pillars of creation in yeah. near infrared with Hubble, right? And you look at that image, and it is gorgeous. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing about JWST is we, it's of course bigger. And so we'll have, you know, higher resolution. Um, but the other thing is it has so many different filters. And so, you know, each of those different filters is sort of keyed as a different color. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the images we get from this telescope should be, you know, spectacular. Yeah. My, my last final question for you, I'll let you go. What's the, what's the moment where you like heave the biggest sigh of relief? Is it, is it like the, like the first signal that the solar panel is deployed or is it like you, you really don't get not nervous until, uh, un, until like it's at L2 or fully deployed? Yeah. Once it's fully deployed, I don't think we get to breathe a sigh of relief until it's fully deployed. That'll take yeah. about two weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, two weeks. Two weeks for so it's not it, before it gets there, but fully deployed. That's when you're less worried. Yes. Like we can yes. we can stop a spacecraft in space. We are, we are capable of this, but but knowing that the the sun shields and the mirrors are doing their things. Yeah. After the deployments are are done, I think everyone is going to collectively breathe a yeah. sigh of relief. Now we still have five and a half months of commissioning before it's going to be ready, right? Yeah. So yeah. it's not going to be next summer until we get the first images because the whole process of getting the mirror like in the mm -hmm. right shape like several mm -hmm. months turning on the instruments takes a couple months so all of this takes a lot of time yeah um but gosh those deployments are what is so scary <laughs> so, i've never seen a spacecraft that's like wait wait you're not gonna believe this look at what i'm about to do <laughs> <laughs> wait till you see this yeah <laughs> and, you know, I have complete faith in our engineers. I, I do know that the team really has done every yeah. single thing possible to mm -hmm. make sure it's going to work. And yeah. I totally, I, it's going to work, you know, but still, <laughs> we yeah. all have some anxiety about this. I mean, oh, yeah. anytime you put or, a, a launch is a controlled explosion, right? Yep. And space is always hard. Space is always hard. Yeah. <laughs> So um, two weeks and I'll be able to sleep a little better. Okay. I haven't been sleeping much over the last week. <laughs> sure. I'm sorry that it's been delayed several times, which is just I making know. it so that now, now everybody's got to work on Christmas. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's a, good, okay. it's a good work on Christmas though. Um, thank you so much for uh, your work. I can't wait until you start getting data to work with. I'm very excited for you. Me too. Um, and I'm also just very grateful for uh, getting to chat with you again. And I'm glad to see you after all these years. Um, yeah. I'm so happy. So happy Yay. that this is happening. Me too. Me too. <laughs>